I'm amazed that there's so many serious people this early in the morning meeting in Washington, D.C. on serious policy issues and on history. History, of course, is no longer a popular subject in our universities or in our policy community. And I want to thank you, uh, Morton, for your kind introduction and for your quotations from uh, Mr. Reagan, President Reagan. We called him Mr. Reagan, usually, uh, because I really did feel, as a staffer on what was in those days a fairly small staff, maybe 60 people, professionals. You know, now Mr. Obama has several hundred. I don't know what they do. They certainly don't seem to make policy. But uh, we all had a personal relationship with this extraordinary gentleman. He really, he may not have remembered our names at times, even very early on. That had nothing to do with his being assassinated and having to make a recovery, as at least one popular radio and television person has said. Uh, he, but he knew who he was dealing with. And I believe that much of his learning about human beings and about the American experience and the American dream was directly related to the interesting fact with, that he was an actor. Do you know that he had to read a lot of scripts? He had to assume a lot of personalities. Uh, he had to take on different roles. He had to respect different ways of life. And he was amazingly tolerant and open and interested in hearing different opinions. And one of the privileges I had working for him, which was different from working for some of the other presidents I worked with, was that he wanted his options papers, his analyses, the preparations for the NSC meetings, National Security Council meetings. And I staffed on arms control in seven years, perhaps 50. And I gave him perhaps 80 or 90 morning briefings, the 930 briefings, when you would discuss what was coming in the NSC meeting or meeting with the ambassadors, the negotiators. And present at those meetings would be the Secretary of State, the, uh, the Defense Secretary, the Director of the CIA, uh, the White House uh, execu senior executive, and so on. And there was a pretty sharp discussion sometimes. And uh, President Reagan would intervene happily and ask a very pointed question. For example, how do you verify that, a mobile, a mobile missile? Or what will the Russians say, the Soviets say? And so I experienced in my seven years there and in the preparation of the strategy that he used to stop losing the Cold War, which we were, uh, because of mistaken strategies and very ab abusive exploitation by the Soviet Union of vulnerabilities in the agreements that they had signed. Uh, and in the, they exploited the fact that the United States, hoping very much for something called detente and peaceful coexistence, had a very different interpretation of that policy than we did. We actually believed, not quite the 60s kissy kissy kumbaya, but that we actually could agree on fundamental differences that had shaped our histories and our policies in the name of mutual interests. It turned out that our mutual interests were not quite the same because one was a revolutionary power seeking to spread a totalitarian message and the other one was fairly happy-go-lucky well-intentioned, not always very correct, um, great power of the United States of America. And so I think the Cold War was about what I have on the front cover of my book. I designed this, but I'm proud of it. It has a Statue of Liberty on it, right? This is the first object I saw when I came as a child to the United States from, from war-torn Europe. I'm one of the few people in this room, probably, who was bombed by Americans and liberated by them. And my father had escaped from Germany 
and joined the American army and become a citizen and came back shooting and liberating his former countrymen. My Swedish mother and I, a British child, were held during the Second World War in, in Germany, caught by the Gestapo. She was taken away several times, but we survived. And when I saw this statue, I knew why we had survived and why it was worthwhile to have survived. I still remember as a child the knock on the, knock on the door society that, that we had experienced. Knock on, the, knock on the door at night and take you away society. Now, uh, here is the truth and light that comes with liberty and it's casting light and truth and hope and, and human rights and religious liberty so you're allowed to say that you worship and believe in God and the symbols of the hammer and sickle and the red stars of China and North Korea Cambodia, Cuba and some other places like that that had their big killing fields. They killed a lot of people when they took over. They usually came in with coalitions or semi-coalitions and wiped out their democratic opposition, including democratic socialists. Already Marx in, in 1848 in his manifesto and in his critique of the Gotha program 30 years, la years later in 1872 had demolished as traitors to the revolution anybody who preached multi-party systems, parliaments, free elections, open elections, courts that were not people's courts set up by the new dictatorship of the proletariat. And um, while he used the word socialist as a phase on the route to communism and the new man and the new society under the new dictatorship, uh, he certainly did not want any uh, democratic versions of it. And for me, when I hear the vocabulary of socialism today, I realize that most people who use that have no idea how different that was. But how it was from the total, completely totalitarian system. But that the problem with socialism is that when the dictatorship of the proletariat in the communist revolution withers away, which was a stupid utopian notion of Marx and, and Engels, what's left is a bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy under Marxism and under socialism owns and controls and plans what? The means of production, the means of distribution, the educational system, the banks of course, the uh, Cultural, the culture is controlled. So it happens that in my family we have musicians and, and, and actors and artists. Those performances, those creations, those personal expressions, idiosyncrasies, descending, dissenting opinions are not tolerated in, by any communist system. Cannot be. And when it is not communist, but merely a socialist bureaucracy, you just try to work in the bureaucracy and get something done efficiently, inexpensively, and on a basis that tolerates creativity and divergence. So the Cold War, in my opinion, started when Marx writes his Revolutionary Manifesto in 1848. He pays no attention to the American experience in revolution and inalienable rights and, and independence and, and uh, balanced powers and legitimacy based on consent. He just says we need a new system and it's got to be like this and he spoke as a prophet. He claimed to be a social scientist, he actually approached, spoke as a prophet. And uh, he was, his philosophy is based on dialectical materialism, which is absolute nonsense about man is completely material and it op operates in a dialectical process and he can be collectivized and the atoms can be changed around. It's a variant on his uh, young Hegelian views. Hegel had talked about a world spirit in which, which thesis and antithesis come out with synthesis and Marx adopts that for dualistic class warfare and the winning class crushes the other one. There is no synthesis, you wipe it out, you eliminate it. You know, the Cambodians, the Khmer Rouge sent the people from the towns into the fields 
to do what? To die. When you're without water and you're sick for a while and have no food, you die. <laughs> so 20% of the Cambodian population after the United States abandoned, abandoned Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos, they wiped out. In, in Laos, the Montagnards were largely wiped out. You know, they were not Vietnamese when the Vietnamese came in. Uh, in. In South Vietnam, it was indoctrination camps and so on. So this system was taken over as a philosophy, an ideology, a faith. And it doesn't make sense, but it's a faith. It was a religious faith. And in the theocracy, as I believe it was, that Lenin imposed in the Soviet Union, he, as you know, did not, he did not overthrow the Tsar. What he overthrew in November 1917 was a coalition government that come in and came in in March that had forced the Tsar's abdication. It was headed by the social, Democratic Socialist, Social Democrat Kerensky. He comes in, he wipes out the coalition, and he cancels their elections and their path to democracy and, and imposes the Marxist-Leninist state, the first totalitarian state. Totalitarian means more, than, more absolute than the czars, more absolute than the 19th century kings, because they controlled all production, planning, culture, everything, propaganda. And that was created in 1917. Now, uh, Reagan was born in 1911, so he would hardly have known about it then, but he sure knew about it later. In 1922 comes the second totalitarian, maybe still initially more authoritarian system, Mussolini, Benito Mussolini, Rome, Italy, a former socialist. He, takes, he imposes his National Socialist version, which he called fascism, based on some Roman symbols of wheat, the fasces, and so on. Then in 1930 came the third form of totalitarian governments, Japanese Empire, militaristic. The emperor had far less power than the military juntas that took over. And then the, the last one came in 1933 with Adolf Hitler and his what? National Socialist German Workers' Party. Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. National Socialism. Socialism is a very popular word. It means a lot of things. And in its nationalist version, which I would include Mao's China with, Central everything, central, and it's, it requires an elite party, a new class that controls everything. And that, of course, invites not only ex abuses of power, but excessive corruption. If one elite controls everything, you know, the guy, who, the Chinese person who just made the bid, who headed the bid for, to buy Marriott who, two weeks ago, was the grandson or son-in-law or whatever of Deng Xiaoping, a former prime minister. These are all princelings. They're all parts of the party apparatus. Now, the, in China, the People's Liberation Army controls most of the industry. And when you invest in China, you, you are allowed to get up to 49% of the profits if you can get them out, but you can't. 49% of the control. So these systems are still going. In the Cuban case, it may not be totalitarian, but man, how many free elections have they had since 1959? That's right, none. And when, when poor Raul Castro was asked by Andrea Mitchell and the CNN fellow about releasing political prisoners, he said, oh, we don't have any. And then he said, give me the list. They'll be out tonight. Because the, the women in white that had been arrested the day before were uh, on the cathedral steps for asking where their husbands and sons were, 8,000 political prisoners are reportedly arrested in the last year, as reported by human rights organization. Those are criminal acts. They're not prisoners. They're not political prisoners. Okay, so Reagan comes through the American Depression. He's an actor. He goes to, to the West. He sees the American dream there in California. And he uh, is a reserve officer. And when the war started, 
He does what? He makes 400 training films for the U.S. Army on why and how Americans should fight the totalitarians. And there were three totalitarians he was fighting. Uh, uh, we were fighting the Hitler, Japan, the Italians, they were in the war somehow. And for 21 months, the Soviets were on the Axis side. For 21 months, they had signed a pact with Hitler. They jointly invaded Poland. Soviet Union takes over the Baltic countries. Soviet Union collapsed about the defeat of capitalism that the capitalist democracies that Hitler was accomplishing in the West. So that's why the, I say the, second, the, the Third World War, the Cold War, involves these first two wars and the histories of totalitarianism. And so Reagan would have been a skeptic about trusting the democ democratic, democratic principles and international legal adherence of the Soviet Union. And then he sees that when we demobilize and we offer the Marshall Plan to the Soviets and we try to uh, get nuclear weapons under control, that they reject all of that. And they have their own coups and they set up what they call the socialist camp in Eastern Europe and they impose Stalinist totalitarian methods. And then he sees that in the 1950s, and he has become a Republican by this time, in the Eisenhower period, that his own trade union, the Screen Actors Guild, is getting subverted by the Communist Party of the United States because they were trying at that point to take over some basic cultural institutions. That's not a wild claim, that's a fact. Uh, and he resisted that and he testified against it. He also realized that from Whitaker Chambers and others that the espionage networks, the influence networks in the United States were in violation of any notions that Roosevelt might have had when he recognized the Soviets in 1933 and they had promised not to do that. It re he re recognized that they were violating the pledges at Potsdam and Yalta that they were recognizing the UN charter that they had signed. And he says, why, why are we letting all of this happen? But he was not in a position to offer his own strategies. But he did notice that the Soviets suppressed the East German uprising in 1953, the Polish and Hungarian uprisings in 1956. They had uh, the Czech uprising, Prague Spring of 1968. And we, the United States, we had notions of containment. We had notions of mutual assured destruction. Crazy strategy that was one of mutual suicide. I opposed it already as a very young civil servant. If you can destroy 40% of the other's population and industry, then they will not, that, will, that fact will deter them from being aggressive. No. The Soviets didn't believe in MAD. They, did, they weren't deterred by that at all. It basically was a policy that paralyzed us. And when M Mr. Reagan, during his campaign, went to Cheyenne Mountain and asked the folks there, what happens in, 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 in Colorado, NORAD, what happens if, if you detect a missile coming in? Um, what do we do? We got 15 minutes of warning for the population. You mean we don't have a missile to shoot them down? No. That's where SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, became a moral and strategic imperative. He also realized already during his platform hearings and the platform being written in 1980, which was a grand strategy for trying to turn around the losses in the, in the Cold War. Remember there were the Soviets had brought 40,000 Cuban infantry into into Africa in the 70s. We had, they were pushing on every single front they could. They were collaborating it already very early with the Iranian Revolution. Uh, they were violating every treaty that they had signed with Mr. Nixon's SALT Treaty, ABM Missile Treaty, the Detente Principles Treaty. And he, he realized that we probably had to start speaking more strongly or again, Truman had done it briefly when he 
was in the fight against the, the Korean, in the Korean situation. We ought to take on their ideology. We ought to take on the totalitarians. We ought to talk about solidarity in Poland. An independent trade union, that's anathema to the Soviets. You can't have, how many independent trade unions are, are there in Cuba or in China? None, it's all state. So we have to do, we have to talk about what this ideology is, that's why evil empire, bizarre, sad chapter of history vocabulary that he used continuously was directed at the moral and strategic challenge and why he got on so well with Mrs. Satcher in England and with Pope John Paul II, the Pole who understood totally, totally what communism was doing to the human soul and how it needed to, that heavy weight ought to be removed. And so he pushed in his strategy, in his proposals, whether it was arms control or diplomatic or public diplomacy or in exchanges for an opening of the conversation with civil society, which wasn't really existing in the communist nations, and spreading the notion that some international standards, what we would call really inalienable God-given rights, were the way to go and to reconcile or bridge gaps and have some chance of accommodation uh, without having nuclear war or without surrendering or appeasing uh, to, to the Soviet momentum. And that's what I happily worked on, and I believe that, and I, I can't go into the different details, I've been limited to 40 minutes <laughs> max, and that's supposed to give question period, and I want to do that. But uh, in issue after issue, whether it was strategic defense, where there was moder military modernization. We had such sh enormous shortfalls in training and maintenance and troop numbers in ships in every field, postponed programs. He had a, a supplemental as early as March 1981, defense 17% increase, and it was worked out ahead of time with the JCS and with the congressional figures, um, and then he did that for the dipl diplomatic corps, he en enhanced the diplomats, although he didn't go with the traditional diplomatic views, which were pretty close to not ever saying anything about the ideology of the other party or some innate differences. Uh, he rebuilt the American intelligence services that, uh, and he listened to them. You remember that Carter, Mr. Carter was very surprised by the Afghan invasion by the Soviets they had tried to brief him so often, and the hearings that uh, Admiral Turner and others did on this, the studies, but Carter wasn't paying attention, nor were his people. And they were making concession after concession. Reagan changed that. He, he stopped the technological high-tech transfers to the Soviet Union. That was sanctions because of the Polish issue. He stopped the flows of hard currency. There were some black programs that have been talked about very little, but that uh, kind of screwed up the technology that was somehow allowed to transfer, and suddenly they, the Soviets p found pipelines exploding and things, and they said, well, we, the, the KGB got this for us. How did this happen? Well, it had been screwed up. Uh, and we broadcast. We broadcast and broadcast and broadcast and had an enormous public diplomacy uh, program to inform our people, our Congress, our allies, and our enemies. Um, one, of the th one of the things that I brought to the arms control negotiations I went to was this, for example. This is called Soviet Military Power. We published this in, in the fall of 81. And it had very great details on our and their military programs. I would bring these to the negotiations and hand them to the second person in the Soviet delegation. It was always a general and always the intelligence, the ranking intelligence official. About a third of a typical Soviet delegation was intelligence. 
and I'd say, sir, we have the latest data on our and your programs. Here are seven copies for your delegation. He never said this is full of lies. He just said to me and to the people just near me, That's, those are state secrets. Can't just state secrets. I said, they're in the New York Times. <laughs> Washington Post, this is our testimony. This is, and your data. You know that for years, the data that we negotiated in the arms control area, as I think we just have been doing in the Iran thing, is to accept their data. No, this time we put in our own data. I mean, they, 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 and they accepted our data. I mean, they, they took, but they didn't offer any. So, and they only had very peripheral data. By the way, this is the Iran uh, agreement that was just signed. It's called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. It has no page numbers. It has no signature. No signature. It has no verification protocol. It's called a treaty or an agreement. It's not. It's a political objective statement where they didn't even have enough agreement to get a, a signed political statement saying what it was. And believe me, you cannot go to suspect sites on short notice as we could with the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Agreement or the START Agreement or the Chemical Weapons Agreement. We did publish a lot of information about the Soviet use of chemicals in, uh, by their proxies in Laos and in Cambodia and in Afghanistan, Yellow Rain, early in 81, and then we made a series of proposals and, and projects. All of the arms control things that the, United, that the United States did was tied to the Soviet cheating patterns and to making them real reductions and real, end up with real equal levels and have a phased withdrawal even while you were modernizing, so it was integrated policy. Um, so. I've given you an introduction to, to this, these issues. I want you to know that I think that, in my mind, Reagan ranks as one of the top three U.S. wartime presidents with uh, George Washington and with Abraham Lincoln, and that he was a phenomenon with superb instincts and a really great interest in history. And as for people writing stuff for him, no. You know, have you ever read his letters, his broadcast manuscripts? Almost no changes. I mean, none of us can write like that. And that was based on knowledge. He read all the time. And uh, I, I, I have to say in the presence of one of the guests here today that I hadn't expected to be here, um, that I wish he had chosen as his vice president in 1980, Mr. Jack Kemp, whose son Jimmy is sitting here. Jack called himself a Lincoln Republican. A Lincoln Republican. And that's an extraordinarily, I think, positive thing to say because it means and remember what I said about the actor. You can engage at a human, decent, caring, loving way with people that have very different views. Because you have in mind the positive common vision. Common vision that, that our country is blessed with. And when, when Reagan said, God bless you and God bless America, he damn well meant it. And so did Jack Kemp. And so do a few other people that are still in politics in spite of the cynicism and the sloganeering and the superficiality. And I personally, as an immigrant here, and this is also not my, my first language, English, um, I, have, I have learned to, to love and have hope and to still dream. Martin Luther King, in his speech, didn't say, I have a dream. No. He started by saying, I still have a dream. And then came the Cascades. I still have a dream. By the way, Martin Luther King gave uh, speeches and wrote a sermon that I had not seen before I wrote my book. About three years ago, I discovered him. He, wrote a, an, uh, he gave a sermon on why a Christian cannot be a communist. And he just denounced communism as a totalitarian, materialistic system that crushed the human soul. And in, in, in Germany, 
He went to East Germany, to West Germany, and gave a speech on freedom in a Lutheran church. And the Lutheran pastor who was translating for him decided to bring him over to East Germany without notice. They made a phone call in that church over there in East Germany. It was suddenly filled with people. The Stasi didn't stop it. He gave the same darn speech on freedom there. Elevating of the human soul. Building your courage, your strength, your witness. You know, witness comes from the word martyr. And you know where the word passion comes from? If you're a compassionate person, which we should be, and some of us are embarrassed to be, or to be called that, passion means, comes from the Latin word passus, which means pain, suffering. So the passion of Christ is the suffering of Christ. When you feel passion, it's not that you're just full of beans and bologna. No, you have felt suffering, you have suffered, you have felt compassion, you have suffered with somebody else. And what are you trying to do about it? You're trying to heal and show and lead. Okay, I've, I've been warned. Okay, well.